So the next thing we're gonna talk about is how we regulate enzyme activity. Think about this scenario. If you were going to go out and you wanted to shut out the lights, um, you wouldn't break the light bulb and then leave your house, and then when you come home, put a new light bulb in the lamp, and then the next time you wanna turn the light out, you break it again. That would be very wasteful. And so in the same way, enzymes in your cells are not made, and then as soon as you're done using them, you break them down. Instead, just like a light or a lamp where we can turn it on and turn it off, enzymes can also be turned on and off. And that way, you don't have to necessarily make new enzymes every time you need them. In some cases, an enzyme may last a long time, and you just turn it on when you need it and turn it off when you don't. So there are two types of what are called inhibitors. So inhibitors are things that shut enzymes down. So they stop the activity of the enzyme, but not necessarily destroy the enzyme, they just stop its activity, at least temporarily. So the first type is called a competitive inhibitor. And a competitive inhibitor is what it sounds like. It's when something competes with the substrate for the active site of the enzyme. So if this is my substrate, and this is my enzyme, and remember this right here is my active site, and a competitive inhibitor might look something like this. It's similar enough in shape to the substrate that it could bind to the active site. Now what's gonna happen is, anytime the enzyme binds to the inhibitor, it's gonna slow it down, right? Because the enzyme is binding to the wrong thing. And I gave the analogy in class that if I'm, if I'm reaching into a bag and I'm supposed to pick up the white papers and rip them in half, but I add to my bag 10 pink papers. Then every time I reach into the bag, um, let's say I have 10 white and 10 pink, um, and I'm supposed to rip these papers in half, I have basically a 50-50 shot every time I reach into the bag of picking up the right thing. If I pick up the pink paper, I have to drop it back in the bag. So this is gonna slow me down. Now, here's the thing about competitive inhibitors, and this is really important. Notice what it says. Increasing the substrate concentration will overcome this type of inhibition. In other words, what does that mean? Well, again, if I have 10 of these and 10 of these, I'm only gonna have about a 50%, my rate is gonna be 50%. I'm only gonna about half the time pick up the correct paper, right? But let's say I increase this and now I have 90 paper of the black and white papers, the correct paper, the substrate. This is my substrate, this is my inhibitor. Well now my rate's gonna increase, right? It's not, I don't have a 50% chance, now I have a 90% chance of picking up the correct thing. So the bottom line is if I increase the black and white papers enough, these pink ones may have almost no effect at all. They'll be almost insignificant compared to the chances of me picking up the correct thing. So increasing the substrate will overcome or cause a competitive inhibitor to have less of an effect. Now the other type of inhibition is called non-competitive. This is where instead of an enzyme, um, or a, I'm sorry, instead of the inhibitor competing for the active site, the inhibitor binds to another spot on the enzyme. It's often called an allosteric site. So imagine that my inhibitor, this is my inhibitor, and my inhibitor binds to this little area back here on the enzyme. This is my active site, I'm using the same theoretical enzyme. Now this time, when my inhibitor binds, what's gonna happen is this. Here's my inhibitor, it binds, and notice how my active site has changed shape. Now my active site will no longer bind to substrates. So this enzyme is basically deactivated. So if you add some non-competitive inhibitor, it's sort of like half your workforce or however many people uh, call in sick that day. The maximum amount of products, the speed that you're gonna be able to go is gonna be cut because now you have less enzymes that are working. All the enzymes that bound to the inhibitor are shut down. Now somebody asked me, is this permanent? It could be, in which case it could be a very bad thing, but your body will do this on purpose and we'll talk about it in a minute. So if you have too much product, sometimes your body will purposely shut enzymes down temporarily. And then as you use up these inhibitors, um, the enzymes will get turned back on. But the bottom line is, if I increase the amount of substrate, so again, if I go back to my paper analogy with my pink and my white papers, instead of adding pink papers to the bag, imagine that there were 50 of us in the room, 50 enzymes, and we were all ripping papers. And now I go around the room and I tie 10 people's hands behind their back. Now I don't have 50 people ripping papers, I only have 40 people ripping papers. So it's gonna take us longer to rip all the papers. That's what's happening with non-competitive inhibitors. 
they basically change the shape of the active site and they shut those enzymes down. Now, some things um, that are dangerous to us, uh, like toxins and poisons, are inhibitors. And that's actually the way that they damage the body. For example, I believe cyanide is an inhibitor of one of the important enzymes in the electron transport chain of cell respiration. So cells can't make ATP when, um, when that inhibitor is added, um, and, and therefore, you know, they, um, they die. So um, inhibitors, this is one of the ways antibiotics kill bacteria. They inhibit particular enzymes that might be necessary to, say, build the cell wall or things like that. All right, here's the graph. You definitely need to know this graph. So this is our enzyme normal rate. Remember that uh, up here, this is representing that the enzyme is saturated. It's working at its maximum. So this is the maximum rate that this enzyme can normally function at. Here's the competitive inhibitor. Notice what happens here is that as we add more and more substrate, if we increase the substrate concentration but leave the amount of inhibitor the same, the inhibitor eventually will have almost no effect at all. Because what effect is a couple of little inhibitors going to have if you have enough of the actual reactant? And then this is the non-competitive inhibitor. And notice that the maximum rate, it sort of flat lines here. So are the enzymes working? Yes. But now the maximum rate that they can work is less. And this doesn't have to flat line right here, by the way. This would depend how much inhibitor you added. If you only added a little bit of non-competitive inhibitor, maybe you get uh, this. It would still flat line because every enzyme that bound to inhibitor is not working anymore. If you added enough of it, you might get a flat line way down here because you shut down almost all the enzymes. But usually when you see inhibitors, it usually doesn't shut it down completely, so you get something around here. But the bottom line is adding more substrate doesn't change the rate of the reaction because the maximum rate has decreased with a non-competitive inhibitor. Those enzymes are shut down. Okay, and this is a nice little diagram of it. So competitive inhibition, you have the substrate and the inhibitor both kind of fighting for the active site. So this is going to kind of slow the enzyme down. Every time it binds to the wrong thing, it's going to be slowed down. And then over here on the right side, I have my non-competitive inhibitor. And notice it changes the shape of the active site. So every enzyme that binds to one of these is basically out of the workforce. And so our maximum rate is going to be slowed down. All right. Um, this is what's showing uh, what's called a metabolic pathway. So a lot of times what's happening in our bodies is a series of reactions, and we're actually going to talk about this in another lecture, but a series of reactions leading to a product. So in this scenario, threonine in your body has to get converted to isoleucine. This is the product that you need. But it doesn't just take one enzyme to do that. It actually takes four, actually five. Um, so the first enzyme, this is sort of like an assembly line, converts threonine to an intermediate that they're not showing here. This is A. Then the second enzyme converts that to B, and the third one to C. And you can just imagine, this is just like an assembly line where, you know, everybody's putting together sandwiches or something like that. This person adds the bread, this person adds the mayo, this person adds the ham. And then at the end, you get your sandwich. Well, it turns out that instead of our bodies making something to shut this down, we can actually, it's sort of self-regulating. And that's called negative feedback, or it can also be called feedback inhibition. Now, what's happening here, in other words, is normally you need this isoleucine, but imagine that you are making too much and you're not using it fast enough. You don't have to run back and produce something to tell this pathway to shut down. Wait, wait, we have too much product. The product itself acts as the inhibitor of enzyme 1. So if we have too much product, it floats around, it sticks to enzyme 1, it's, an, it's a non-competitive inhibitor, and this shuts everything down. And now, as you start to use up the product, it would get pulled back off the enzyme, and the pathway would resume. So this is the way that our bodies will self-regulate many reactions, is that the end product of the reaction itself will actually behave as the inhibitor to shut the pathway down. And then as we use it up, it'll turn the pathway back on. So we don't have to make some third-party thing to regulate this pathway. It'll regulate itself. All right, now kind of the opposite of inhibitors are what are called coenzymes and cofactors. These are things that help enzymes take on the correct shape. So a cofactor, the difference is that cofactors are typically metal ions. So if you see, for example, zinc or iron or potassium, if they tell you that the thing helping the enzyme have the correct shape, notice what this is doing. It's not shutting the enzyme down. It's that this enzyme is not activated until this thing binds to it, and now the enzyme takes on the correct shape. If they tell you it's an element, then it's a cofactor. 
If they say it's a vitamin, then it's a coenzyme. And they pretty much do the same thing. So they help certain enzymes take on the correct shape so the enzymes can react with their uh, substrates to form products. For example, I know that vitamin A is a necessary vitamin, so it's a coenzyme, and it's necessary to help you with night vision. That it's, it works in the eyes, uh, with enzymes in the eyes, to help um, the, those enzymes that help to function under low light for you to see. And so one of the problems with a vitamin A deficiency is night blindness. Vitamin K is an important um, vitamin that's involved in blood clotting. A lack of vitamin K in your blood might not clot properly if you get a cut um, because it's a coenzyme that's necessary to help activate the enzymes that are involved. So those are what coenzymes and cofactors are. Okay, and then wrapping things up, again, a metabolic pathway is a, is a series of reactions that allows something to happen in small steps. I just showed you one. So any pathway that breaks things down is called a catabolic pathway, like digesting your food, breaking glucose down. Uh, breaking glucose down, it, it takes like 20 steps to go through the entire cell respiration process. And then anabolic pathways build things. So anabolism is building and catabolism is breaking down. You kind of just need to memorize that. And both of these types of pathways involve enzymes. Enzymes are involved in the steps to build things and break things down. Um, and this is just an animation that shows this. I got this online showing, again, another example of a metabolic pathway. Notice how there's three enzymes. So in this one, this is the pathway for making melanin, which is a pigment in your skin. Um, somebody who's, for example, an albino, they don't make any skin pigment, so they're, they're very, very white, like my albino hedgehog. Um, has a genetic disorder where they're missing one of these enzymes. So it, they could be missing any one of the three. If enzyme two doesn't work, if, enzyme, if any of these don't work, you're not going to get the product. But um, this is just an example of a metabolic pathway, the fact that it takes several steps to make a product. And this is just showing some different examples of metabolic pathways. It could be several steps. It could be a cycle. There could be a detour where it makes one product, or if there's too much of that, it goes a different way and makes another product. Um, and the very last thing we're going to talk about here is what's called energy coupling. So notice in this picture how the rocks are falling. The rocks are falling off the mountain either way, but the energy of the rock falling is sort of wasted, if you think about it, because it's turned into mechanical energy and heat energy. But notice what's happened here. We added a gear. Now the energy of the rocks falling is being captured and transferred to do work. So by adding this little gear, the rocks were going to fall already, but instead of the energy sort of getting wasted as heat, some of that energy is being used to pull up the bucket. Well, that's called energy coupling, and we do it in our body. And the little gear would be like ATP. ATP takes the energy that's released from exergonic reactions, and it brings it to endergonic reactions that require energy. So this is what ATP looks like, um, and this is sort of a shorthand way. And notice how what's really important is that third phosphate. When it breaks off, it releases energy. And so ATP, adenosine triphosphate, when the phosphate breaks off, it's an energy carrier, and it passes the energy, energy coupling, from um, that third phosphate. It'll basically attach to other things. It's called phosphorylation, when a phosphate attaches to other things. And when it does that, it often changes the shape of the molecule it attaches to so it can react better. And you saw this already in the sodium-potassium pump. When the phosphate broke off of ATP and it became ADP, that's what changed the shape of the protein in the pump. So when ATP breaks down into ADP, um, it releases energy. And that phosphate then can, can be used to attach to other, oops, other reactions. Um, and again, to wrap things up, you don't store energy long-term in ATP. It's only you consume, uh, regenerate, and make your ATP like 10 million every single second in every single cell. So this is not like fat that stores energy for a long time. Um, you know, you that's why you can have brain damage without oxygen after about six minutes, because after about six minutes, all the ATP are gone. You've broken them all down. And without oxygen, you really, you can make ATP, but not very many, not enough to for all the reactions that need it. So you break things down, and that releases energy. ATP, sort of like playing hot potato, captures that energy, in other words, by putting that phosphate on. And then the energy can be passed to other things to do cell work and do cell processes. So that's how ATP is what's called an energy coupler.